Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Shir Hever in Germany. In the past 46 years, Israel established numerous colonies in the occupied Palestinian territory and in the occupied Syrian Golan Heights. Products from these colonies are exported to the rest of the world, almost always under the label Made in Israel. Some of this may be changing now, as half of the European governments are openly calling for accurate labeling of products from the illegal colonies. I've spoken to Michael Dees, European coordinator of the BNC, the Boycott National Committee, a coalition of NGOs, committees, and organizations in Palestine that supports the, and leads the BDS campaign. BDS stands for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions. Hello, Michael. Could you explain what are the news regarding the labeling of colony products in Europe? What we're beginning to see is a, a really exciting development and that's that European governments are starting to realize that there's economic support for Israel's occupation coming from Europe, and that it's, it's no longer sufficient just to condemn Israeli settlement activity. Um, and they're starting to match their words with some deeds. So back in um, May 2012, the European Union Foreign Affairs Council um, issued a recommendation that governments should advise retailers to put special labels on products coming from illegal Israeli settlements. Um, popular pressure in the form of boycott, divestment and sanctions campaigns have really raised awareness about buying goods from Israel and buying goods from, from settlements in particular. And consumers really want to know if a product is marked made in Israel, whether, it's really marked, whether it really is from Israel or whether it's in fact from, from an illegal Israeli settlement. So governments in the UK, in Denmark, in the Netherlands have now said that they support this recommendation of the European um, Foreign Affairs Council and will indeed start to tell retailers that they should put special labels to make it clear that, that settlement produce is, is not, from, not from Israel. And does that make uh, the labeling of colony products mandatory? The UK issued non-binding voluntary advice to uh, retailers back in 2009. Um, so now in, in Tesco's, for example, a major UK supermarket, you will see some products marked uh, Israeli settlement pro products. Um, and the way in which the guidance is written, it's written as if to say to the retailers, we believe that existing consumer protection law, so existing law on how products should be labeled, advise that uh, products should be labeled, settlement products should be, should be labeled differently from Israeli products. And this is very much the way in which the the Danish guidance has been drafted as well. So it's not legally binding per se, but it's government advice that states that in order to comply with existing legislation, you should put special labels on, on illegal settlement produce. But it's, it's not yet mandatory and, and there aren't any penalties for retailers who, who flat the guidance and, and many retailers do continue to flat the guidance. Well, shouldn't uh, products be, that are produced in an illegal colony be illegal to sell? Shouldn't uh, uh, that uh, be a very clear point? And wh why is there uh, just a focus on the labeling of the product? First of all, we have to welcome uh, the, the, the decision by European governments to issue this labeling guidance. It's a really significant first step. Um, that shows an acknowledgement on, on their part that there is this support for the occupation coming from Europe and that they've got to do more than just condemn illegal Israeli settlements. But in our view, there are several problems um, with this labelling policy. Um, we would argue that European states have an obligation to ban settlement trade. Um, when the International Court of Justice in 2004 ruled that Israel's settlements and, and apartheid wall was illegal, it ruled also that this places obligations on, on other signatories to the Geneva Convention and that, that European states and other states are obliged not to render assistance or to recognize as legal um, illegal Israeli settlements. So we argue that states have a, a duty to not recognize the legal settlements and to, to put in place a legally binding ban of all trade with illegal Israeli settlements and with companies operating inside illegal settlements. So we believe that the labeling is a first step, but that governments are actually obliged to go much further. The other problem with um, the labeling is that Israeli agricultural companies, Israeli, all Israeli settlement exporters, but especially Israeli agricultural export companies, routinely lie um, about the origin um, of, of, of their produce. So some researchers from a UK organization, Corporate Watch, recently found inside an illegal settlement um, products marked for a UK supermarket, Morrison's, uh, and it was in the Morrison's packaging, but it, it was marked made in Israel. 
despite the packaging and, and the products themselves being in an illegal settlement, and it was clear that, that the produce was from an illegal settlement. Even assuming that regulations pass to label these products, what kind of mechanisms exist to enforce these decisions on Israel? How can European customs know uh, that the label that they read on the product actually uh, accurately represents the source of the product? The way in which trade globally operates, not just with Israel, is that it relies on trust. It relies on, on trusting the authorities of the, the export country, and it relies on, on trusting the company that, that's exporting. Um, but the reality is, in, in, in a situation where Israel is routinely violating international law, and where companies operating in settlements are actively participating in those violations of international law, these companies and, and Israeli state authorities simply can't be trusted um, to, to tell the truth about where produce comes from. Um, trade with settlements is uh, really significant to their continued development and growth, so Israel and, and settlement exporters want that trade to be able to continue. So really, the only way to ensure that no settlement uh, products are reaching European markets would be to ban trade with any company that's known to export from illegal Israeli settlements. And this precisely was the position that was adopted by the cooperative supermarket in the UK. It's a, a cooperative members run supermarket, the fourth biggest supermarket in the UK. And following a, a sustained campaign by its members and by Palestine solidarity activists, the supermarket decided that it would no longer trade with any company known to export from illegal Israeli settlements, regardless of, of where the particular products were claiming to, to claim to come from. So I think this is the only, this kind of comprehensive measure is the only way to be sure that we're not providing economic support for illegal settlements. And what is the situation regarding products that contain a, com a combination of components, components from the uh, illegal occupied territories and uh, also components from inside Israel? The official estimates used, uh, provided by the Israeli government and then used um, by the European Union state that only about 2% of Israeli exports come from illegal settlements. But when you factor in products that are partly uh, produced in settlements, the volume of Israeli exports uh, involving some, some form of production in settlements rises to 33%. Unfortunately, uh, the European Union and member state governments haven't really started to take on board the way in which um, Israel refuses to delineate between, between Israel and the illegal settlements. So in, in the minds of um, Israeli capitalists in the minds of Israeli businesses, there's really no distinction. So it's very often, it's very common that production will take place both inside Israel and illegal settlements, and that the whole product will be packaged made in Israel, or that products produced inside Israel and in illegal settlements will be packaged together and bundled out in front of shipment. And that's why we argue that the only way to end financial support for illegal settlements is to refuse to introduce a, a ban or to persuade businesses not to trade with any company that's known to have any of its operations inside illegal settlements. Let's move from the legal uh, questions to the more political level. What is the purpose of, of labeling these products and what is the purpose of boycotting them? Israel seems set on continuing to colonize as much of, as much of the West Bank um, as it possibly can. And international trade with illegal Israeli settlements are really financing that ongoing colonization of Palestinian land. Last month in, in February, Palestinian agricultural organizations issued an appeal for action to be taken against Israeli agricultural export companies because of the role that they play in the wholesale destruction of Palestinian agriculture. So Palestinian farmers face the brunt of Israel's system of house demolitions, of land theft, of the theft of, of water. Uh, Palestinian farmers who still have access to land and water face systematically imposed restrictions on, on movement of goods, of movement of people and so on, and, and face violence from radical settlers and, and from the military during harvest times. So by saying that we, we don't want to trade with companies that are, are benefiting and, and, and participating in this process, we're showing our solidarity with the struggle of Palestinian farmers who are resisting uh, to, to try and stay on their land. And we're also signaling our opposition to Israel's settlement policies, but also to the, the totality of Israel's apartheid system over, over the Palestinian people. Israel's occupation of the Palestinian territory is about 46 years old now. Why is Europe waking up only now? Why is there suddenly an interest in uh, 
labeling the settlement products? The dominant discourse within European politics uh, on the Middle East is still very much of, of, of the two-state um, solution. And I think as, as Israel continues its settlement expansion, uh, with the, the, especially with the, the recent Israeli elections and, and many sort of pro-settlement expansion um, parties playing prominent roles in, in, in the new government, there's a, a fear within European governments that the two-state solution uh, will no longer be viable in, in, in the very near future. I mean, if you, if you speak to Palestinian activists, they'll say that the two-state solution is, is, is no longer viable. But the European governments are slowly starting to realize that settlement expansion is making the two-state solution less and less viable as time goes on. And they're starting to realize that their, their condemnations, their nicely worded letters to Israeli government officials really have very little impact. Um, so it's this fear of, of the end of the two-state solution uh, and, and a realization that, that they need to do more than simply condemn Israeli settlement activity. So are you saying this is a last-ditch effort of the European governments to save the two-state solution? I think in terms of the way in which it's viewed by um, a number of, of European governments and by some of the larger European NGOs and development agencies, um, that are, have been pushing for uh, settlement trade ban or, or labeling at the governmental level. Yes, it, it's very much that these measures are coming to the fore now that the two-state solution um, seems, seems to be um, on its last legs, even to the most sort of conservative of, of European advisors, uh, uh, observers. From the point of view of Palestinian activists, regardless of their position on the one-state or the two-state solution, how do they perceive the labeling policies uh, of the colony products? I think Palestinian organizations um, are certainly welcoming um, this as a, a first step towards uh, further, more restrictive uh, measures against Israeli settlement trade and, and harsher measures on Israel in general. Um, the, the, the discourse and the language and the demands being used by Palestinian organizations, for example, the agricultural organizations that were, have, have issued this, this appeal for action back in February, it's not using this same... Uh, frame that European uh, organizations and, and, and some European politicians are using. It's very much about pressuring Israel to apply, to, to, to comply with basic tenets of international law and pressuring European governments and businesses to abide by their own obligations under international law and to recognize that European businesses and European trade with Israel and illegal Israeli settlements makes European businesses and European economies deeply entwined and deeply complicit with Israel's ongoing efforts to capture as, as much of the West Bank as it can. And from the point of view of the Israeli government, what kind of response did the Israeli government give uh, to the issue of labeling colony products? As well as, as European governments um, taking these kinds of steps. Um, towards in, in August of last year, the, the government of South Africa announced that it would also start to label Israeli settlement goods. And this was hugely significant, of course, because of um, the way in which Palestinian activists are increasingly describing Israel's system as, a, as an apartheid system and, and the support of South African civil society and government therefore being really, really important. When South Africa announced that it was going to start labeling illegal uh, settlement produce, the Israeli government responded by condemning South Africa as an apartheid state and saying that South Africa was still an apartheid state. And indeed, when, when uh, Denmark announced its labeling and, and, and last month when the Netherlands announced it would, it would start to instruct businesses to, to label Israeli settlement bodies, the reaction from the Israeli government has been nothing short of hysterical. And they call it discrimination against the settlements and so on. And I think there's a, a real fear on the, on the part of Israeli leaders um, that once, once one or two measures like this begin to, to be implemented, then the door is open to a, a ban on, on settlement trade or to other measures like an end to, to military trade with Israel, for example. So there's real fear from Israeli leaders about the implications of, of this first step because they too realize that this allows uh, Palestinian organizations to push for much, much further measures. Beyond the symbolic importance of South Africa, the trade between Israel and South Africa is rather small, but isn't the situation with Europe different? Yeah, I mean, there's a huge volume um, of trade between, uh, between Europe and Israel. Um, some 
different sets of statistics differ, but most sets of statistics still seem to show that the EU is um, Israel's largest export market. Um, and this is especially true for, for fresh produce. So in 2010, Israel exported fruit and vegetables worth over 2 billion US dollars. Uh, and 66% of that was to, to European markets. And most European consumers will come across um, Israeli agricultural produce, fresh fruits and vegetables in the supermarkets and so on. And other Israeli businesses, for example, um, SodaStream, which is a, a sort of soft drinks machine. Its products are manufactured in an illegal settlement. SodaStream is currently undergoing a huge uh, marketing expansion throughout Europe. Uh, and, and so Europe is really seen as an absolutely vital market for Israeli exports. Thank you very much, Michael, for joining us. Thank you very much, yeah. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.